This video is going to be on microcytic anemias. Now recall microcytic means that the red blood cell is smaller. So I'll write microcytic. And by definition, it means that the MCV is under 80. What's the mechanism behind why it's microcytic? Well, it's because there's a problem with hemoglobin synthesis. That is the underlying problem. And that causes it to be microcytic, whether it's because you're missing an important part of the red blood cell hemoglobin, or whether that, that defect causes uh, a problem in maturation and growing of the red blood cell. Whatever the case, you get microcytic red blood cells, microcytic anemia. Now I wanna take a quick detour and just talk about hemoglobin synthesis. Okay, so we're going to take a quick detour, a little side quest before we go back into microcytic anemia. We're going to just talk about everything we know about the production of hemoglobin and the production of blood. We touched on it briefly earlier. We talked about how your bone marrow has these hematopoietic stem cells and that goes on to make your common myeloid progenitor and your common lymphoid progenitor. And from your myeloid, you make your RBCs and that's somewhat EPO controlled. Correct? That was just a broad overview, but I want to take it further back and I want to go into more detail. So let's take it further back, all the way back to when you were an embryo. Now when you were an embryo, you didn't have bones, and so you couldn't do that pathway because that required the bone marrow. Instead you had a yolk sac. We we're kind of like chickens, we have a yolk. So our first production of blood actually comes from our yolk sac. And as you grow, uh, the yolk sac will eventually go away, but we still don't have our bones yet. That's a problem. So our other organs come in, kick in, and kind of take its place. We talked about that when we talked about extra medullary hematopoiesis. So we talked about how your liver can come in and take its place. Liver. We talked about how your spleen can come in and take its place. But then eventually you start to build your bones, and then your bone marrow will be the final production and your permanent production of blood. So all right, bone marrow. And so you make your blood. And your blood has a ton of different proteins and antigens on its surface. It's basically speckled all over with proteins and antigens. And we can categorize blood by the proteins and the antigens. And there are, there are about 35 different grouping types. The main ones you need to know is going to be your ABO grouping. ABO grouping. And your rhesus grouping or RH grouping. We'll talk about ABO first. Again, that grouping is grouping it by what proteins are found on the surface. So ABL proteins are made by your ABL gene and your ABL gene is co-dominant. Very important you know that. That means anything it has, it will be expressed. There's no recessive um, masking. So it's co-dominant. So just take for example, if you have A, blood, then you have the A protein. By definition, you have the A protein. And a rule of thumb is that you will make antibodies against things you don't have. Yeah, That way you can tell what's yours and what's not. So A blood, all right, A will have antibodies against B. So another example of yeah, B blood, you'd have a B antigen. I'll just denote it as a circle. And again, you have antibodies against everything else, just to tell what's yours and what isn't. So you're gonna have antibodies against A. And if you have O, then O, I always think of O as in zero, it looks kind of like a zero. You actually have no antigens, no A, B antigens. So it looks like a clean slate and therefore you're going to have antibodies against both A and B. Now finally you can have A, B gene and because it's codominant you express both of them. So AB blood would have both your A antigen on the top and your B antigen on the top by definition. So what, do you, what antibodies does your blood make? Well, it can't make A because it has A. It can't make B because it has B. So you actually have no 
antibodies against other blood. This is why it's sometimes called the universal recipient because it doesn't have any antibodies so it can take any blood. So right, universal recipient. Can it donate blood to other people? No. Because it has the antibodies of A and B, can't donate to A, can't donate to B, can't donate to O. All these have antibodies against it. So the only blood that can receive AB will be AB blood because it'd be the universal recipient. So it can only donate blood to uh, patients that have AB blood. So that's the universal recipient. The universal donor is gonna be your O. Why is it the universal donor? because it doesn't have any antigens on its surface. So you can give it to B, and that has antigens against A, and it'll look for A, won't find anything. You can give it to group A, which has antigens against B, it'll look for antigen B, won't find anything. Here, there's no antibody, so it doesn't really matter. And that's why it's called the universal donor. There's a lot of O's in the name. There's an O in blood type, so it should be easy to remember. But if you know the mechanism, then that's just that's just icing on the cake, essentially. Now we now we talked about how ABO is codominant. So if you have AB, you have the expression of both. Uh, group type A, you can have A and you can also have AO. They all look the same. Why do they look the same? Because O doesn't have any antigen. So you exp you'll express A, you'll also express O, but because O doesn't have any antigen, it's basically A. Uh, B is the same thing, you can have BO, and then O, you can have O or OO. That is your ABO blood type. Something, that, something that's been asked, not USMLE related, but just asked in general, they'll say, why does a patient with A blood develop antibodies to B if they've never been exposed to, to blood? It's because when you're born, you actually don't have B antigens, but, uh, but the B antigen isn't unique to blood, it's seen in bacteria, it's seen in food products. So when a baby, is born, they don't have that, but once they start feeding, once they get exposed to bacteria and food products, they will develop the antibody to be. So that's what causes it to form. That's just a side note. I don't think they'll quiz you on it, but something for you to know. So that's AB blood. Let's talk about RH blood. Now RH is actually uh, five different proteins, but the most important one is gonna be your D protein or your D antigen. And by definition, if a patient is RH positive, they have that D antigen on their blood. And if the patient is RH negative, they don't have that D antigen on the blood. Makes perfect sense. Here's the, the clinical importance of that. If a mom is RH negative and is carrying an RH positive baby, and um, there's some sort of bleeding, or during delivery, there's a mixture of the blood, the mom will start to develop antibodies against D. Antibodies against the D antigen. That just makes sense. It sees that as foreign develops, develops those antibodies. So you deliver that baby, uh, the, the baby's fine, but your mom is gonna start to develop those antibodies. And if you have another baby and that, and that baby is also D positive, then those preformed antibodies will attack the baby and cause RH hemolytic disease of the newborn. That's no good. How can we prevent that? Well, we can prevent that by giving the mom during the first pregnancy something called Rogam. And Rogam looks for D antigens and sequesters it, hides it from the mom so the mom never sees it and the mom never develops those antibodies. And by doing that, you don't get sensitized, you don't develop those antibodies and your subsequent pregnancies will be fine. So Rogam, that's a big one. So that affects your second child. Your first child sensitizes the mom, but it's the second child that gets the brunt of it. Well, if a patient comes in with the first child and the first child has it, that's not, that's not normal. If the first child has it, it can't be RH hemolytic disease. So by default, it's gonna be an ABO hemolytic disease. Your mom has an uh, ABO blood type that's incompatible with the baby's ABO blood type. And the first pregnancy though, develop that disease. The most common of which will be a mom that has O blood. Why? Because your O blood has antibodies against both A and B by default. And so it just gives you a bigger chance of developing hemolytic disease. So I'll write ABO hemolytic disease. 
most common in O moms. That's what your blood is grossly, but what is it microscopically? What is blood made out of? Well, blood is made out of heme and globin, and we, together we just call it hemoglobin. So hemoglobin, or heme and globin. Let's talk about the globin part first. The globin is gonna be these large protein units. And in these protein units, in these globins, we have heme. And heme is a porphyrin ring with an iron in the center. And it's that iron that binds your oxygen and carries it. So, all right, iron in the center. Now we'll talk about globin first in a little more detail and then we'll move on to heme in a little more detail. So we'll talk about globins. Globins in adults is mainly going to be two alpha globins. So two alpha and two beta. Two betas. And that's what makes up the majority of your hemoglobin and your blood. We call that HbA1. Now that hasn't always been the case. When you were a fetus, you didn't have HbA1. What did you have instead? You have fetal hemoglobin, that's right. So as a fetus, you have two alphas, but you have two gammas. All right, gamma. And we call that hemoglobin F, or fetal hemoglobin. And you need that different type of hemoglobin because this hemoglobin isn't as susceptible to uh, 2, 3 BPG. We talked about that in our rest block. And because of that, it can buy and take oxygen from the mom. If not, it, it wouldn't be able to steal that oxygen. So that's why we have fetal hemoglobin. Uh, something you should be aware of is even before we're a fetus, when we're an embryo, we have a special type of hemoglobin. We call that embryonic hemoglobin. Not a lot of people are aware of that, so it's an easy trick question. An embryonic hemoglobin is pretty funky. We have a we have zeta chains, and we have epsilon chains. But that goes away pretty quickly, and then for the rest of your fetal life, you have majority uh, fetal hemoglobin. One more thing I want to talk about is, as you grow older, your fetal hemoglobin will decrease, and then your adult hemoglobin will increase. Correct? That's just a natural process. There is a normal variant of this adult hemoglobin that's called hemoglobin A2. And that normal variant is just two alphas and two deltas, sometimes drawn as that. That's a lowercase delta. And that is just a, a variant, a normal variant. It makes up about one to three percent of your blood cells. That's normal. Don't get freaked out. That is just a normal variant. And they want you to know that. Sometimes they'll ask about it. But I'd like for you to know all the different types of globin. Um, I've gotten a few questions on it. You should also know the symbols. Unfortunately, it feels like they're testing you more about whether or not you've been like in a frat or instead of testing medicine because I've seen questions that just test the symbols. And so know what delta looks like, know what gamma looks like. Uh, I haven't seen much on embryonic globins, but you might as well know what zeta and epsilon looks like too. Those are your globins. Let's move on to heme. Heme is made in your liver. And heme is not only found in your blood, but it's also found in liver enzymes like cytochromes. Very important you know that. And it's also very important you know, recall our little hemoglobin with our globin chains and our heme and our iron that binds in the middle. If you have a problem with your heme synthesis, then that iron can't bind and you actually have increased iron. Anytime you have a problem with heme. So I'll say, I'll say increased iron with heme synthesis problems. Let's just talk about heme synthesis. Heme synthesis is only about half a dozen steps. So it's not too bad. And it all starts when glycine combines with sacino 
to form amino levonic acid. We'll just shorthand it and call it ALA via the enzyme amino levonic acid synthase. Hey, that's nice and easy to remember. There's a cofactor in here, B6. Important you know that. ALA will get worked on by ALA dehydrogenase, which becomes porphobilinogen, or BPG. BPG gets worked on by BPG deaminase, which becomes hydroxymethylbutane, hydroxymethylbutane. This step isn't as important as what it becomes, and that is that it becomes uroporphyrinogen. Three. Uroporphyrinogen gets worked on by uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase to make copropyrinogen three. Copro porphyrinogen. That eventually becomes protoporphyrinogen and then protoporphyrin. So all right, protoporphyrin. Nine. And when that combines with iron, the enzyme ferrochelatase, because I guess it senses the iron, comes in and we have heme, and that is our heme synthesis. So that was the big picture. I know that was a whole lot, but now we're gonna go into a little bit more detail about each and every one of these steps and see where things can go wrong. We'll start with the first step. Glycine and succinyl-CoA becomes ALA via ALA synthase with the help of B6. Now this first step is important because it is a rate limiting step. So if we want to increase heme production or we want to decrease heme production, we're usually talking about this step. How can we decrease heme production? Well, the easiest thing we can think of is if there's too much heme, then that's just negative feedback, right? That's nothing too fancy. So all right, decrease production with things like heme. How about a deficiency in B6? That's a cofactor, right? So if you have a deficiency in B6, that's going to be difficult to make your heme. A common way to ask B6 deficiency, if you, if you saw my biochem chem videos, is isoniazid. That's the anti-TB drug that blocks B6 production. So isoniazid. And then one less intuitive one is glucose. Glucose blocks the production of heme. Uh, this all happens in your liver, recall. Heme synthesis happens in your liver. And, we, and when you have too much glucose, you kind of shift the liver's function into something else. And so you kind of lower heme synthesis. So all this lowers production. What increases production? That'd be anything that induces your cytochromes. Why is that? We said that heme is also needed in your cytochrome. So if you have a drug that induces cytochromes and revs it up, it's gonna use up all that heme. And when it uses up all that heme, it's gonna say, oh, we're low on heme. We're gonna just make this cycle work harder. And that's why induced cytochromes rev up heme. So revs up the cycle. So that makes sense. Now what can go wrong? Well, we can have an inherited deficiency in this. We call that, we call that X-linked sideroblastic anemia. So this is an X-linked disorder, judging by the name, and because you don't have this, because you don't have this enzyme, you can't make heme. That's X-linked sideroblastic anemia. Let's jump to our next step. ALA gets worked on by ALA dehydrogenase to make PBG. This step is blocked by lead. And we're gonna talk about lead at the end, but I just want you to know that this step is blocked by lead. Now let's move on. BPG gets worked on by BPG deaminase to make HMB. A deficiency in BPG deaminase will cause an increase in its substrate. 
porphobilinogen or BPG. So I'll just write, I'll write the whole name. And unfortunately for us, this is toxic. It's not only toxic to our, our liver, but it's also toxic to our, to our myelin. So toxic to myelin. And when it builds up, it can precipitate out as a, in the urine as co porpho bilinogen. And, and it's also toxic to our urinary system. So you're gonna have signs of all of these. You're gonna have signs of uh, abdominal pain. From, you're gonna have signs of a myelin destruction, so neuropathy. You're gonna have signs of, signs of toxicity in your urinary system. So you're gonna have um, painful urination. And when you leave the urine out, because of this toxic byproduct, it actually turns the urine a color, a purple color. We call this culmination of signs acute intermittent porphyria. Porphyria means purple and is named after the purple urine. Now the, the neuropathy and the abdominal pain is somewhat not specific, but the purple urine is a big sign. And that's why we call it porphyria. Okay? And that's all due to a deficiency in PBG deaminase. So we can diagnose it by looking for this in the urine. Yeah, that's, some, that's some kind of more specific sign. We can do genetic testing if there's a genetic cause of this deficiency. And we treat it. How do you think we're going to treat it? We're going to try and stop the cycle, stop it from revving up and causing these byproducts to build up. So we're going to try and stop the cycle. And we can stop it by giving heme. We can stop it by giving glucose. And that's exactly what we do. So if they have an acute exacerbation, we give them IV glucose and we give them heme. Hopefully stops this pathway. That's acute intermittent porphyria. Let's go back to our pathway. We have HMP, which eventually becomes uroporphyrinogen. And uroporphyrinogen gets worked on by uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase to become co-proporphyrinogen. And if you have a deficiency in this enzyme, UPG decarboxylase, you get another porphyria. Ah, so porphyria rears its ugly head again. So you get another porphyria. This is due to a buildup of its substrate, so a buildup of this. And when this builds up, it can cause similar symptoms, but one of the most classical symptoms of a buildup of uroporphyrinogen is that there, it reacts to light. It causes these reactive oxygen species that cause blistering, causes eruption, causes skin discoloration. So I write discoloration, skin discoloration, eruption, as well as the normal purple urine. So we call this porphyria because it affects the skin. Porphyria cutanea, as in cutaneous tissue, tarda. Porphyria cutanea, and it's due to a deficiency in this enzyme, UPG decarboxylase. Know that well? How do we treat it? Treatment is a little bit different from, from here. We can, we do phlebotomy. Why do we do phlebotomy? We say anytime there's a problem with heme synthesis, you can have increased iron. So this just removes some of the iron. We can avoid sunlight, that's a big one. Uh, we can also give anti-malarials. Why the heck we do that? Uh, anti-malarials stop the malarial parasite by aggregating heme. And by aggregating heme to a point where it's toxic to the red blood cell and toxic to a parasite, it can stop parasites that way. So by giving anti-malarials, we aggregate heme, and anytime we have increased heme, that decreases production, correct? So that's another way we can stop the cycle. And that is porphyria cutanea. Back to our pathway. So we have coproporphyrinogen, which becomes protoporphyrin. And protoporphyrin combines with iron and the iron-related enzyme ferrochelatase to become heme. Ferrochelatase is blocked by lead. That's why I didn't want to talk about lead until the end, because we see it in two different places. We see it blocking ALA dehydrogenase, we see it blocking ferrochelatase. So I write lead here. Blocks ALA synthase and it blocks 
Chico Taste. And anytime you have a block, you have a buildup of the byproducts. So you'll have a buildup of protoporphyrin, increased protoporphyrin. You're gonna have a buildup of ALA, so ALA. That's how lead poisoning can cause anemia. Uh, how I've seen them ask lead poisoning in questions, they'll talk about a child who maybe lives in an older home because back then the old houses were painted with lead paint. The child will start to develop crampy, colicky pain, have, maybe have mental changes. That's a big tip off of lead. So if a child in an old house has those symptoms, think lead. Or the parent might just straight up say, I, I saw a little baby eat paint chips. So you're thinking of lead poisoning. In adults, it's more seen in people that work with batteries, automotive, um, ammunition, paint. So that's, and then if they start developing cocky pain, mental changes, you're thinking of lead. But in any case, uh, that's how it causes anemia. And that is your heme pathway. One more thing I want to talk about, we said what revs up. We said, we talked about what lowers production and we also talked about what revs up production. So anything that induces cytochrome enzymes. Anything that induces cytochrome enzymes will make any of these worse because you're going to basically keep forcing down this pathway even though you're deficient in these enzymes. So just know that well. So all right, revs up cycle makes things worse. And that is our talk on heme. Now we can get back to our talk on microcytic anemia. So that was a slight detour, but I think we're back on track now. Thanks for watching. See you next time.